please subscribe. Chris Pixer today with Austin BQ, who is going to be a candidate in the second congressional district. Mm-hmm. Yes. Austin is uh, announced that um, he's going to challenge him. Austin, uh, thanks for coming on, man. And uh, tell me, um, what made you decide to get into this race? Well, I th- I've always kind of been interested in politics, you know, even going back to like kindergarten and first grade. Uh, my elementary school had us make a recycling project and I had my parents help me make a ballot box. So, you know, politics is just something that I've kind of inherently known is super important and uh, deserves a lot more attention than I think it gets kind of at the ground floor. Because so many people do question, you know, I, these people don't represent my interests, so what do I care? You know, they're going to keep getting elected anyway. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next reason for getting involved in this. Uh, so I know you're just so fine. You know, there's there's a lot of people that we need to keep track of and what they're doing in Congress and in the state house. So, you know, it's not surprising that, you know, sometimes names get switched up. But, you know, I think in the conversations I've been having with people across the political spectrum, because, you know, keep in mind that, yes, I'm running as a Democrat, but I'm also trying to reach out to moderates, uh, to those who lean to the right. You know, I'm trying to be as inclusive a political campaign as we possibly can. And in these conversations I've been having with people uh, across the aisle, they're not very happy with the work that Representative Moore has been doing. Uh, You know, I've heard several complaints. I've had people reach out to me and say that they've contacted his campaign office or his uh, congressional office to talk about issues that are important to them and just have never heard back. So they've been reaching out to me instead. You know, I have heard that he's really not getting the job done. He's towing the line of a certain former president in everything that he has done, uh, whether it's, you know, he's he's towing the same line, whether it's voting against a bill that would uh, continue to fund and expand access to child sex crime investigations. Uh, he and several other Republicans were the only holdouts in the House on that. All the way to when I was at the Democratic Convention in early May, he was in Hungary headlining CPAC Hungary and meeting with Viktor Orban. And so I just think, you know, across the board, we realize that our current representatives are just not cutting it anymore. You know, politics. Oh, ag- I'm sorry. I want to cut you off for one second before I forget. And I'm sorry to interrupt you. What, what was his reason for uh, uh, that with sex crimes? That looks like that would be everybody would be uh, uh, in favor of that type of bill. You know, you would think, but I have not heard anything about it. You know, as, as my staff have been kind of tracking his legislative agenda, uh, we just kind of flagged that as a curious, you know, maybe that's something to ask him about. You know, well, why why did he vote against that? Um, you know, I'd like to give him, you know, I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt and that maybe there was something else in there in the bill that shouldn't be in there. Uh, but at first glance, I'm just a little confused as to who would be voting against that. Uh, But, you know, so just across the board, we see that the status quo is not working. And so uh, despite being 26 and having just graduated college a couple of years ago, uh, I kind of realized if I want things to change, I have to be willing to put myself on the front line and do it. You know, I can't wait for others to do it. I have to be the one to get out there and do it myself. And that's that's really the root of why I'm running and uh, why we're dedicating so much time and money and effort to really trying to flip this district and making sure that we have representatives that will fight for people and not for profit margins. That's a great answer right there. Let me ask you this. What, what makes, what what makes you a Democrat? So I feel like I align a little bit more closely with the democratic party than I do, you know, the Republican party. Uh, There are some things where I can kind of understand where Republicans are coming from. Uh, You know, I can understand why they want to shrink the deficit. You know, I get it. We we can't just keep astronomically spending and not pulling anything in. I get that. Um, I get that we need to make sure that our streets are safe and that our people can do what we have to do uh, without being robbed or attacked. You know, I, I get the public safety. But on the flip side, I don't understand the continuous attacks on impoverished people. I don't understand the attacks on minorities, whether that's racial minorities, whether that's women, uh, whether that's 
sexual orientation or gender identity. I don't understand the attacks on minority citizens. And I also don't understand the attacks on, you know, people immigrating to the United States. I, I don't understand what the, what the big deal with allowing immigrants into the country is. I don't understand uh, what the attack on people's personal medical decisions are. You know, when you get right down to it, yeah, you know, we do need public safety. Yes, we do need to, you know, try to rein in the deficit as much as possible. But on the flip side, I think we can work towards that without attacking vulnerable communities. Uh, so instead of using um, scare tactics, we should sit down and be able to discuss things and reach compromises. You, you would hope, you know, because I like to tell people, and this is something that's been lost in the modern political era, politics is not a winner-take-all, zero-sum game. You know, just because one particular party holds the majority in any given legislature or executive department doesn't mean that the other party has no representation. It's not a dictatorship of whoever wins. Politics is and always should have been about compromise. You know, we, we see it going all the way back to the founding of the nation itself. I mean, you look at the Constitution. The Constitution was a compromise between the 13 colonies. It was a major compromise between the North and the South over the issue of slavery, of course, but there's compromises all throughout. You know, if you go back and you read the debates of the Constitutional Convention, you see not every colony was in agreement about our system of government. Some wanted a stronger executive, some wanted a weaker executive, some wanted more states' rights, some didn't. Politics should always be about finding the compromise and working for the best number of people and mitigating the damage we do to the most number of people. Well, you know, now that you mention that, it's, it's really something that's happened over the last 30 years or so, because I can remember as a child, the compromise that was worked out with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, mm -hmm. compromises that was worked out. Uh, you know, with with uh, uh, bu budget deficits, um, uh, you know, I, I can n name, you know, just keep naming more and more and more. But now it's either you're either one side or you're on the other and there is nothing going to, uh, you know, there's, it's either one way or the other. Um, uh, one thing I want to touch on before I forgot too, when you spoke about transgender, it seems like that America has been kowtowing to such a small percentage of the votes. How do you feel about the transgender community um, as, as a whole? Are they asking for too much too soon? Is this something that, sh you know, maybe we should allow people to get used to this fact before we start saying, you know, you know, hey, Bud Light commercials with trans transgender people. In. I mean, I mean, it seems like it's being forced down people's throats too soon and not giving them a chance to. I mean, it hasn't been that long ago that we got, used to gay marriages okay people have now gotten used to that and in some places we're still not used to that it's, yeah, right in some places we're some some not used to that but but it, it seems to be getting better do, do you think that we we're, we're going too far too soon with this or we're not going uh, f uh far enough so and i speak only in my capacity as somebody who is running for congress as an openly gay man and so I can kind of, you know, understand to some degree where this is coming from. But, you know, it, it took a long time to get people used to the LGBT community as a whole. I feel like what's happening, though, is that we are not only not getting used to it. In a lot of places, things are going backwards. And so I think there is a fine line between allowing corporations to use it as an advertising technique almost you know i'm not i'm not big on allowing corporations to kind of flaunt any particular demographic just for their own profit margin but on the flip side we also have to understand trans transgender people do exist and at this particular time what's being called into question is not whether or not we're actually affording them too many rights. What's being called into question is, do they even exist? Um, I've been doing phone calls for support and donations for the campaign. I had somebody on a Democratic list who, when I asked what their important issues are, the first thing out of his mouth 
was that transgender people are mentally ill sex predators and need to be locked up for the rest of their lives. You know, they need to be locked up, they need to be imprisoned, they need to, and so I think when that is the rhetoric, uh, we are not, it's not that, it's not a question of are we moving too fast too soon, it's a question of if we don't continue moving forward, uh, we're going to see a huge issue down the line in terms of continuing attacks on transgender people. Right now, those attacks are legislative, you know, rolling back federal protections, rolling back their ability to receive health care. In the future, it may move from a legislative attack to physical attacks. And in some places, it has already. You know, you can go on the news or on the internet at any given time, and there's just a litany of LGBT people who are attacked, who are beaten, who are harassed. So I don't believe that we're giving too much too soon, because at this point in time, it's about survival. It's about, you know, can we acknowledge that transgender people exist and allow them to live their lives in peace? You know, that's, that's so, what's being asked. The, the reason I ask that is, is because I know, um, I, I, know and, and, and I know some gay men, and they are, uh, I, I don't want to say against, but they don't like the whole transgender, that they feel like it's, um, uh, it's too much. Um, I don't know if you've ran across any gay men like that before, but you know, they're saying, Hey, this is too much. And these are probably not your typical. And I, I don't really want to say typical, but these are guys that, you know, I hunt and fish with that you would never think that mm-hmm. they were gay. So, um, you, you know, they, they, these are the types that don't like it. So when they're on, I guess, community doesn't like it. Is, do, do we not have to start with in before we can work out? So I think part of that is just visibility, you know? And if you're not a trans person, then I don't think you really will understand what it's sure. like. You know, just like I will never know what it's like to be a woman in America and have right. my reproductive rights on the chopping block. I will never know what it's like to be a black person in America and know what it is to be racially profiled just walking down the street or shopping in a store. We, those of us who are, you know, cisgendered, who identify as the, the gender and the sex we were born into, I don't think we will ever truly understand the experience of transgender people in the United States, but that's okay. You know, it's not up to us to understand every facet of their experience, but it is incumbent upon us and it is our job to make sure that we're looking out for people. And so I think a big part of that is visibility. You know, if transgender people don't feel comfortable enough being themselves in public, then nobody will ever get accustomed to it. You know, nobody ever will want to try to understand their perspective or try to engage with them person to person rather than as a demographic. You know, so I think visibility is important. And I know there are a lot of gay people who are, you know, not on board with transgender people or quote-unquote queer people but I also just have to say look you know there are a lot of people on the outside who are still not okay with gay people and so if we are going to use our time to attack other members of uh, disenfranchised and under fire minority groups we're going to be in for a world of hurt because the same people out there who are campaigning against transgender people once they're done with transgender people, who do you think is the next demographic on the chopping block? It's going to be gay people, you know? So sure, go ahead and cut off the TQ of the LGBTQ, but pretty soon after that, we're going to see the rest of the letters go away too. So, well, you know, this is the point that, you know, I, I do lean conservative. Uh, now, with that being said, uh, I'm not the type of um, conservative or conservative Republican because I have voted for Democrats. I don't tow the company line. Um, you know, if one of our leaders come out and says, this is how it's going to be, and if I don't agree with it, I'm not towing the company line. I'm not going along with it. I agree with it. You know, too many of our Republican leaders are scared of um, uh, of the leadership and they won't go along with it. And I'm just, I'm just not like that. You know, I, I'm not going to tow the company line if my heart feels like it's not right. And when it comes to transgender people, you know, I hear this stuff, choose and stuff like that. I, I don't think anybody would choose to be transgender and go through what they are scrutinized to 
in society. I, I just don't believe that. I believe I do believe that people are born are, are born that way, and you know, there's nothing they can do to change it one way or another. Um, yeah, you know, how we're going to move past that, I don't know. Um, which brings me to my next question: what um, What are your views on Second Amendment? And how do we stop school shootings? So, very big pro Second Amendment guy. You know, I grew up around guns. Uh, my grandparents have a farm in Kentucky, which is where I originally come from. And, you know, I've shot guns with my brother before, who was also very pro Second Amendment. I'm not scared of guns. You know, it's part of the American way. And I think that's something that to some degree should be celebrated and embraced. You know, talking about the Constitution again, I love the Constitution. I'm a bit, I carry a copy of it wherever I go, whether I'm going to work, you know, going on a trip, a vacation. I always keep a copy of the Constitution with me. And the founding fathers recognized that, look, if we want to keep our American freedom and our American way of life, we're going to have to have the right to bear arms. It's not it's not debatable, not not discussable. And I think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. When it comes to stopping school shootings, number one, we have got to have better and faster access to mental health care. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know, shootings don't just happen out of the blue. There are signs. There, there are patterns of behavior and very clear things to look for that raise red flags where it's like, hey, something serious is about to happen. You need to intervene. What we need to do is we need to be training teachers and administrators to better find those signs and maybe see if they can intervene and stop the situation from happening before it does. We also need better and more affordable and accessible health care. So, you know, right now there are people out there who are going through mental health issues, but they can't afford a therapist. They can't afford a counselor. They can't afford these things that would help prevent the next great tragedy. And so we need to absolutely have better access to affordable health care. In some ways, we also need to tighten our background checks and some red flag laws. Like if you have been flagged as a, someone who is engaged in domestic violence, if you have been flagged as someone who has committed an, a violent crime, then, you know, I think we need to take a very close look at, do you need a deadly weapon? I don't think you know? anybody that says, uh, you know, deadly weapon or domestic violence or anything like that should have a, uh, a weapon. Right. And, you know, and that's, I think, I think, you know, things like that get lost in debate when we start using terms like common sense gun control laws. Number one, because it's not a gun control law. And number two, because it's, it's very reasonable. You know, if you have been, you know, if you are currently embroiled in a situation where you are having to prove that you were not responsible for a violent crime, or if you have been indicted and convicted for a violent crime, I think we need to take a very hard look at whether or not you need access to a weapon that can kill a room full of people in 30 seconds. And, you know, if we, if we as a public can't agree on that one single compromise, then you know, we can just rinse and repeat, you know, every three weeks, another school shooting, another shooting in a supermarket, you know, we have got to find a way to compromise. And it is going to take both sides. Democrats cannot just blanket ban whatever they want. It's not constitutional. It's not going to pass Congress. On the flip side, Republicans cannot just throw open the floodgates for everyone and their brother to buy whatever weapon they want whenever they want. And I know, you know, there are some people on the extremes of both sides, but we have got to find a common sense middle ground where we can say, look, the right to bear arms is important constitutionally, but so is the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of the people who are constantly in danger of being killed in mass shootings. There has to be a compromise. There's no way there is not a compromise. It's just that people are unwilling to compromise because they want it to be a winner take all. And so we're gonna continue losing life until people decide it's time to have a serious conversation about how we can end gun violence. What would what should we do to bring back jobs in the United States? Like I live in Birmingham and we still have all the um, 
um, minerals or whatever to produce coal, I mean, to produce steel. But we have no steel jobs here in Birmingham anymore. And we were one time the, the uh, you know, the Pittsburgh of the South, uh, where we, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, we had, you could walk, we, a kid could go out of high school in the 70s and get a great paying job that had benefits, you know, vacation, and would work there for 40 years and retire with a great retirement. And all those are gone. I mean, what can we do to get those types of jobs back to the United States? So number one, and this actually plays into a key point on what my campaign has released publicly as the new square deal for Americans. Oh, yeah, I meant to ask you about that. Yeah, so it's part of our policy platform to reform our education system. Part of that is we want to knock down economic barriers so people can attend public colleges free of charge. So if you're a student who has done well in school, you and your family will no longer have to ask yourselves, how how can I afford college? How can I move to that next step? Two and four year public colleges will be free of charge, but so will trade schools and tech programs. We have got to understand, and a lot of this has been lost in the noise, particularly of the No Child Left Behind Act and the major push for everybody to go to college as opposed to trades. We have to understand we are digging ourselves a grave here because in a couple of generations, if we keep at this, we are not going to have any more people with knowledge of the trades and tech programs. We're just not. You know, we're going to lose access to so much knowledge and so many people who would be able to keep our country functioning. The problem is our tech people and our trade schools are oftentimes treated as less than than people and colleges who are giving college educations, and that's not the case. Hey, let me so stop we right want. There. Uh, let me stop you right there. I didn't mean to cut you off because that was something I wanted to say. You know, you would not realize how many people that I've talked to that have a uh, PhD in uh, theater that is sitting down at Starbucks on their laptop talking about the ills of economy, the you know the ills of um, of capitalism, and you know complaining about that, uh, making seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour when you've got an electrician out here making ninety thousand dollars an hour, living in a four thousand square foot house, driving three new vehicles, and you know what's more important here. You know, because you've got a college education or because this guy has a trade that keeps America running. Exactly. And what so many people don't understand, and that's not to devalue our professors. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my colleagues there. (laughs) But um, no, so what people don't understand is, of course, the people who do get these degrees and who teach the next generation are helping, you know, astronomically. One of my closest friends is an actor. He's an actor and a model. He's doing great things over in Atlanta. He got his degree in performing arts and theater. He's doing great. And the arts are super important. They really are. I like to refer to the arts like almost as the soul of our nation, you know. But if we focus only on the soul of the nation, then the body of the nation, the people who work with their hands, our blue collar workforce, And the people who are the nuts and bolts of our foundation and keep our society standing, if they fall by the wayside, how can the soul continue existing? And just look at what we've got in Alabama with all of our trade school and junior college acts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they are so important. And so often trade programs are just overlooked and considered less than. They're, They're options for the people, you know, quote unquote, who just couldn't hack it in college. Right. And I'm like, we cannot treat our people like that. Number one, morally, that is not right. Number two, these these are people. Who are you going to go to when you need your engine repaired? I'm, I'm sure a, not going to do it. <laughs> you know, I, I consider myself a, a, a above intelligence guy. You know, I've always tested well. Pretty smart guy. Uh, hey, a guy who knows how to do electrical or air conditioning or work on a car, man, he's a lot smarter than I am. Yeah. Well, see, the ACT is not going to help me fix my air conditioning or my car. Exactly. But the person who went to a trade school or a tech program and knows how to do that in a day and a half, I'll pay whatever they want me to pay. Some people are more <laughs> mechanical. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're right, right. Some people are more, ma- more mechanically inclined to do that. It doesn't mean they're stupid. It means they're smarter no. with their hands than what I am smarter 
And we have got to open the gates to people who can do that. We have got to make tech programs and and trade schools not only affordable but accessible and make it seem like a fantastic option, like the fantastic option it is. So we have got to make sure that our middle school and high schools, as well as our community colleges and even our four-year colleges, have pathways open to students who may not be excelling academically, but man, they are excelling when it comes to trades and it comes to tech programs. So let me ask you this. Um, you're talking about, you know, painful. Uh, we already have student loans and Pell Grants um, that people can go to. Um, uh, how are we going to, I mean, what are we going to do to pay for these? If people can already get grants and loans, are, are you just are you suppo- are suggesting that the government pays for it entirely? And if so, how do you how do they propose to pay for that? So interestingly enough, I'm actually a college recruiter by day and then a political candidate on my off hours. So I speak with a lot of students who, despite the Pell Grants, despite the loans, despite the scholarships, still can't afford it. It's still, you know, and, and then for people like me who when we filed for FAFSA, on paper, my parents just made too much, even though they're still paying back student loans and other debt. So we're not seeing the material income. We also on have paper, the medical. They, yeah, we do have that. But, you know, there are also people who that's just not their cup of tea. And do, do we really want to say, you know, every single person who wants access to college has to go through the military? I think we're going to see our military take a very big downward spiral. <laughs> I, I agree with you on that because being a combat vet, there are certain people that are cut out for the military. And I don't mean that, you know, they're, they, they don't have physically aren't to do it. Some people aren't mentally cut out to go through what you have to go through. Right. In basic combat training. And I'm not saying that in any t- type of derogatory way towards anybody. You know, the it's military just not their is, cup of tea. Right. It's just, you know, not what they're, what they're called to do. It's not what they were made to do. I think, really, this comes down to, A, making sure that people who make these 10, 20, 30 million and billion dollars a year are not able to stash that money in offshore tax havens. You know, if we can close the loopholes where they can stash things in Switzerland, they can stash things in the Cayman Islands, suddenly we're going to see, even if we tax them at just 10%, if someone is making $30 billion a year, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten billion dollars a year, 10% of that, we're going to be able to start funding these programs. Well, that brings a question I have for you. Um, last year, and I have to get it up again, 1% of the, the one percenters paid almost 40% of the taxes. We cut the tax off at around $567,000. So in order to do this, would it shouldn't we make a higher tax bracket? Hey, if you make seven hundred thousand dollars a year, then you get hit with you know a higher tax bracket, eight hundred thousand, nine hundred. We should. Now the, instead of cutting it off at just five hundred thousand, because when you have a guy like Elon Musk, you know, with billions of dollars a year, and he's only paying at the top level five hundred thousand, there's a lot of money that's income, you know, that's not getting taxed. And there you know, is. we need to make a bracket. With if you make over a million dollars a year, you're now paying 15% regardless of what you make. And then that flat 15% for anybody over a million dollars, suddenly it's going to be amazing. You know, the, the person making a million dollars a year will be paying the same 15%, but 15% of a million dollars is going to be vastly different than $5 billion. And the same thing for corporations. You know, there is no reason why people or corporations making over a million dollars are not paying at least 15 percent of that every year. You know, I got it's not a lot to ask. No, it's not. I got curious about, you know, when some of this stuff started happening. And I got looking in the Johnson administration and in the late Johnson administration, corporations were paying around 23 percent taxes. And now it's like six percent. That's where we're losing Tremendous amounts mm-hmm. of revenue. You have, you know, Amazon or whatever making $13 billion a year and they're paying almost zero taxes on it. And do you know who pays for that deficit? 
Who's that? You and me, the average American. The average American is now footing the bill because Amazon doesn't want to pay 15% of taxes on their $10 billion year or whatever it is. You know, I've not looked at their income for the last year, but you know it's in the billion because Jeff Bezos had been, had, had been the richest man until just recently. I wanted to run this idea by you. I ran it through several people and they shoot me down and say, no, that's a horrible idea. Um, I actually think it's would be a pretty good idea. If we have a minimum wage, shouldn't we have a maximum wage? I mean, if you want to get technical, yes, that's doable. You know, I imagine the argument that you have been getting is that decreases people's desire to work harder. Right. <laughs> you know, but if you make people you know, $200 million dollars a year. <laughs> Well, see, that just goes to like the major CEOs and the major presidents of these companies cutting themselves, you know, three, four, five hundred percent pay increases while they're still paying their workers poverty wages. That is a major problem. And I don't know if we can better solve it by a maximum wage or by setting federal, federal regulators more power to intervene and say, no, that's illegal. You cannot just cut yourself. Like, you know, maybe if we allowed corporations and board of directors to increase CEO and other board member salaries in proportion to how they increase their quote unquote ordinary worker salary. You know, maybe they can't increase their salary 50% above what they increase their workers. And so if they want their salaries to jump up, they have to pay more into their workers. You know, there's different ways that it could be looked at, you know, whether that is setting a just maximum cut off or setting it proportionally but again that's something we're all going to have to compromise on and the name of the game right now is not necessarily compromise it's grab as much as i can in terms of winning and you know screw everybody else well i'll tell you what you sound like to me and uh without my of course minus the uh the race problems we had you remind me of one of our old south democrats that we used to have that promoted a brand of populism that the masses could relate to. I mean, I'm not opposed to being called a populist. You know, it's all, you know, if we're not working on behalf of our people, then we need to be out of office. That, that's the main thing. If you are not willing to work on behalf of the people, whether it's because you're beholden to corporate interest or special interest or big donors, get out of office. You know, we need to be working for the average American not the millionaires and the billionaires and the big corporations. And so if people want to call me populist, I will wear it like a badge. I'll wear it like this American flag right here. I mean, because that will that will get a lot of people's attention because, uh, you know, when you start talking about populism, because if you think about this right here, and, and for, when I first say it, you'll be like, oh, no way. But if you think it through, in 2016, the message of Donald Trump and uh, Sanders was not that far off. When the things that they it were wasn't. talking about, they were, what they were wanting to do, and people are ready for that. They're tired of seeing them having to work. You know, in the fifties, uh, a paycheck took care of a family of four. Now people are working four paychecks to take care of the family of four, and it's still not enough. They're still living paycheck to paycheck and having to wonder, "Am I going to make it to the next week?" Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. said the other day, he said, there are uh, like 60% of Americans do not have $1,000 in the bank in case of an emergency. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those Americans. You know, I am one of those Americans that he was talking about. And that's not something that I'm ashamed to admit, because we need more average Americans running for office. If you want to see policies that work on behalf of the average American, you have got to start voting the average Joe into office. We cannot keep voting legacy people into office, and we cannot continue voting rich people into office, or else we're going to continue to get the same old, same old catering to the super wealthy. And I don't think any of us want that. And that Maybe the hit, super wealthy uh, want that. That just hit a, uh, when you said that just uh, sparked something in the back of my mind. I remember reading a quote one time. George Wallace said, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the two political parties. And at first, I didn't really know what he was talking about. Until later on, I got it dawned on me what he meant was both of them are sellouts to the special interest groups. It just depends on which one they're sellouts to. 
I mean, I would love to have some kind of argument to that. You know, I'm running as a Democrat because I closely align with a lot of their policies. But there are a lot of Democrats in office who are taking just as much special interest in corporate money as Republicans. And so, you know, not to throw stones at the party that's supporting me on the ballot, but we also have to understand, look, and I, and I don't think it's necessarily a party thing. You know, it's a who is funding the campaigns. If you're getting money from the super wealthy and the corporate donors and they're keeping you in office, what do we expect? I mean, you know, if you were in office and your entire campaign was funded by corporations and mega donors, are you going to say or do anything that shakes the that shakes the that boat and rocks and that boat and make cut off the one man war I'm waging against the Public Service Commission? If you've read looked at those articles, I'm pointing out everything that, that I mean, they're funding them, and so they're going to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. uh, so exactly. Um. You, you make it to Washington. First day in there, what piece of legislation are you going to introduce? I'm going to introduce, number one, an increase in the minimum wage because there is no reason that people should still be living on 725 when inflation and just the global economics have raised astronomically. And it's been number two, two years. Mm -hmm, it's been a long time since we have raised. Number two, we will be looking at implementing a single payer, and this is another part of our new square deal for the American people. We will be introducing legislation which will implement a single payer healthcare system option for the American people. So number one, it'll sort of be an expansion of the Affordable Care Act, but it goes further in saying that if you don't have private health insurance coverage, or you want to opt out of your private coverage for the single payer option, you will no longer owe a dime, copay or otherwise, for medical treatment, emergency services, or prescription medication that you have been prescribed by a doctor. Is this like a Medicare for all? Yes. Yeah. But it's a Medicare for all option. So it's like, you know, if people don't trust the system or maybe they're satisfied with their private health insurance, well, keep it. We're not going to make you drop it. If you want to keep your co-pays and your private insurance, you are welcome to it. But if you're not covered or if you realize, hey, maybe it is way too expensive, I want to give the public option to try. It is open for you. I like that idea because, you know, so many people, and I'm sorry to interrupt you again, they still yeah. um, rail and, 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 you know, bash um, the Affordable Care Act. Well, the President Obama himself said this was not the – you know the 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 end end all thing. This was just this was a mm -hmm. something to put in place to build on. You know, and the only to... thing we in Alabama have gotten from it is being able to stay on parental insurance until we're twenty six, because the state of Alabama for the last ten years has not expanded the Affordable Care Act, despite the fact that the government would pay ninety percent of it, and we would only have to pay ten out of the state treasury. Wow. So you want to look at the real problem. Look at the fact that the Republican supermajority in the state legislature for a decade or longer has refused to even do the bare minimum to expand the Affordable Care Act. It won't be a problem any longer. First day in Washington, D.C., my staff and I are going to sit down and we are going to write the legislation which will implement a public Medicare for all single payer option. And then fine. If Alabama doesn't want to expand Medicare or Medicaid, if Tennessee doesn't want to expand it, if Georgia, Florida, Missouri, they don't have to anymore. We have gone over and above them at that point in time. Are there any other ideas, uh, legislative ideas, that you think would be beneficial to not only Alabama, but to the rest of the uh, country? Yes, absolutely. So, number one, we want to look at, and this is just, you know, we've talked about the Medicare for all which is point one of the new square deal for the American people. We've talked about the education system. Uh, part of that is we also want to expand teacher salary and benefits, not just presently, but retroactively. So if you are a retired teacher who has given your life to educating these next generations, you're going to see your retirement fund increase astronomically. There is no reason our teachers should be living in poverty. You know, my grandmother was a teacher exactly. in rural Kentucky. My mother is currently a teacher at Auburn Montgomery. 
So I see what they have to go through in terms of paycheck to paycheck living. And then when my grandmother retired, she was still substitute teaching in order to supplement their retirement. And they shouldn't have to do that. If you have given your life to public service by teaching our nation's children, you are no longer going to have to worry about living paycheck to paycheck once you retire or once you take up that role. We are going to increase teacher salary and their benefits both now and retroactively. And we're also going to reduce class sizes to help make it more manageable for our teachers and more profitable and efficient for our students. We also want to look at slowly transitioning to a green energy source. So nothing huge, nothing major. We're not going to pass a bill that says in 30 days we all have to be on green energy. But we want to invest in research to help make it profitable, efficient, and affordable for not just companies and businesses, but private citizens to be able to phase out non-renewable energy in favor of renewable energy. And so I know Alabama, uh, if you switch to green energy, solar panels, all that stuff, you have to pay astronomically higher bills to Alabama Power. You know, do you realize that by the time you pay that, you're almost not saving anything? No, you're not saving anything. And I think that's the point. And I think we can agree that's the point. And yeah, so, you know, we're going to. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to pass a law. Number one, that stops that. That's going to be done. Like game, set, match. We will be passing a bill which, which makes it illegal for power companies to do that. Number two, we want to make it easier for people to be able to get grants or loans or help transitioning their homes, their businesses, their companies to greener energy. And we also don't want to leave the workforce behind. We want to make sure that we're funding the states so that they can host uh, training sessions and schools to help people who were in these jobs that may be getting impacted by moving to green energy transition them and their workforce to green energy and renewable energy jobs as well. We can't leave behind blue collar workers no matter what we do. We have got to make sure that if we're fighting for the good of all Americans, it includes our blue collar workers because otherwise we're not fighting for America. We're fighting for the elite. We're fighting for the, the, the super rich, the super wealthy, the people who it looks good to fight for, not the average American. And that's not what we're going to be doing here, even when it comes to green energy. But um, again, the final point is, of course, we want to protect our civil rights. So we want to pass legislation that makes, you know, attacks on the LGBT community federally recognized hate crimes. We want to make sure that women have the option to do, you know, to make decisions and to live their life without fear of being attacked or harassed. We want to make sure that whether you're any kind of minority, whether that's a racial minority, a gender minority, or a sexual orientation minority, you can exist in society on an even playing field and not have to worry about being attacked or discriminated against just for being a little bit different. And so we need to enshrine protections for these marginalized communities in federal law. And we also need to ensure that the bills we're passing economically and educationally also take into account that a lot of times people come from different backgrounds and have different starting points. You know, I was blessed with a family that was able to take very good care of my education. Even though we were in the public education system, they had enough money to hire tutors to, you know, get me the help that I needed academically. And if they weren't doing that, then I had parents who worked flexible jobs enough that paid them well enough to be available to help me with homework, help me with test prep, help me with the ACT. A lot of people, especially in rural and urban areas, where parents are having to work three, four, five, six jobs, uh, where schools are not funded properly, don't have those same benefits. So as we're moving forward with enshrining protections for minority groups into law, we also need to take into account that people come from different starting places and we need to make sure that everybody is, you know, playing on equal ground so that everybody has access to the same opportunities going forward that the next person has. That doesn't mean that the outcome has to be 100% equal because the outcome will never be 100% equal. You know, I'm sure there are people who are working in college environments who, who are in the same position I am, but they're making more money than me. 
And, you know, that's just that's just the luck of the draw. But if we can make sure that everybody is getting the same fair shake that everybody else is getting, then really we can make sure that everyone is able to put the work in to make something great, not just of themselves, but of our nation, too. That was very well articulate the way you said that. Uh, I believe that Thank you. the way you address that right there, you can. Um, I believe that that will relate with all Alabamians, you know, no matter what their education level is. Um, I, I was very impressed by the way you said that. You seem to have the um, the best interest of the Alabamian at heart instead of just the one particular group, so to speak. You know, some people run. You know, I'm all. I'm, all, I'm only for running for this group. I'm only for this. I had a, and I would say I had a, I interviewed a candidate for the, uh, for U.S. Senate last time. And he told me, he said, I'm running for the black gay agenda. And I said, what does that mean? So shouldn't you be running for all Alabamians? I mean, what does that mean? But you came across as you were here for all Alabamians, you know, black, white, Hispanic, uh, Latino, gay, straight, uh, you know, indigent, uh, wealthy, that we're, all born with inalienable rights that came from our creator and that we should all um, live up to them. When we cut recording, there's a few things I want to talk to you about. Um, do you have any opponents right now that you're running against for the DNC or for the Democratic nomination? Currently, I am the only Democrat running. Then um, that, 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 that that's a good thing right now because we're less than, you know, eight months to go. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, this has been one of the best interviews I've ever conducted. I was very impressed. Uh, you know, I didn't trip you up at all. Um, and, you know, you answered my questions well. Uh, I wish you the best of luck in this. Um, is there anything else that um, you want the voters to uh, know before we cut? Yeah, absolutely. So to the voters out there, I understand if you don't agree with every single policy point that I have pitched in this or that you may see on the website. But we have to take into consideration, we need to be voting for what's best for Alabama. And so even if we don't agree 110%, if you are finding yourself nodding your head and saying, yes, this sounds like a better deal, this sounds like a better option, please go to the polls. Donate to the campaign, go to the ballot, make an election day plan, and get your friends, your coworkers, and your family members to vote too. We can flip this district and we can have representatives both at the state level and the national level who are working on your best interests. But that also relies on you. There are gonna have to be compromises we make. And if you don't like every single policy I pitch, tell me, let's talk about it. I won't be offended. I won't be angry. I want to hear what you have to say, because if I'm not running for you, the American voter, I shouldn't be running at all. So please, well, if, you, if you agree with most of what I have said, but are kind of iffy on some things, reach out to us and let's talk about it. And most importantly, please vote. If you don't vote, not only can I not win, but things cannot get better across the board. Take, take your rights into your own hands and don't leave anything to chance, either in March during the primary or next November during the general. Come out for us and we will show up for you too. And hopefully we'll uh, talk again. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. You know, you actually are the first person to interview us, so you get to be the one who has broken the story <laughs> on our candidacy. Great, great. I'm so glad of that. Um, and uh, I mean, and good luck for this man. I hope you do well. And to, thank I'll, you. Questions, a uh, couple questions we cut, but yeah, I'm glad I broke this, and um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. But uh, I'm, I'm glad I got to be the first person to break this. But uh, thank you I so am much. Too. Thank Good you luck. for having me. Thank you.